Since the dawn of time, man has dreamed of taking to the skies. The thought of soaring above the clouds provided advancement in human freedom and a great milestone for humanity to reach. In the year of 1903, humanity finally achieved it. Heavier than air, powered, and controlled flight. And since the first man jumped off a cliff trying to imitate a bird, it's been a human tradition to throw ourselves into various doohickeys and contraptions designed to stay airborne for prolonged periods. After thousands of years and hundreds of doohickeys through the ages, we finally achieved it. And ever since then, we've been speeding through aviation design. So much so that people born at the time where there were no airplanes at all lived long enough to see us land on the moon. In just 100 years since that first invention, we have gone from backyard contraptions that amaze people by flying a mere 50 feet, to behemoth craft in the sky that fly over us at altitudes incomprehensible to the people of old Earth. Like, you see that place 10 kilometers above us where no human could breathe, traverse, or even survive for more than a minute or so at most? Yeah, we just have wars there sometimes, to flex on God. Only mere years after the first plane was invented, it didn't take long for us to slap a weapon on it and go to war, for that matter. Since then, fighter aircraft have always been seen as the pinnacle of aviation. With the most intense flight performance, detection, and weaponry, fighter planes constantly awe the world with their incredible performance and capabilities. So to celebrate the cool factor on these planes, I want to build one from every decade. But, just like Lockheed Martin, if we want to sell cool planes every 10 years, then we need endless wars. There is a problem though. Messier82 as a channel doesn't endorse any real life politics unless we're just making fun of it. To avoid taking any real life sides, we need a country. So we'll be dumping a random mass into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and taking the winning side of various wars throughout the last century to keep our conquesting country prosperously alive and endlessly enthralled in combat aircraft. This nation will be called the United Federation of Bo. Named lovingly after our cat, Bo. The UFB, for short, will constantly be involved in endless wars, and its citizens will be complacent with this due to constant diversions, luxuries, and pleasures. We'll even make cool edits of our vehicles and military with songs playing in the background, so that way people forget how awful it actually is. In fact, I bet they'll watch people die and beg for more in the comments. This will keep them from ever acting out against the cycle of constant war, allowing us to build our airplanes in peace. The war of the decade is World War I. Spanning from 1914 to 1918, this war was a result of various tensions and variables boiling over to a breaking point in Europe. The United Federation of Bo can't wait to stick their grubby little hands in this conflict, giving grants to the GT Motor Corporation, or a custom-made aeronautical contractor, to build them a fighter plane. The UFB will be taking the side of the Triple Entente as to not mess with history, as well as making them rename themselves to the Quadruple Entente as a result. I don't think they'll be too happy about that one. So let's take a look at how I designed this thing. Let's start with the power plant and the fuel. Planes during World War I could often be considered dirty by modern standards. Most World War I aircraft used incredibly low-grade fuel, leading to very low engine pre-ignition temperatures inside the combustion chamber, and therefore very low power engines. Let's talk in terms of octane, even though the measurement system was not popular at the time. By not popular, I mean that the octane rating didn't even exist yet. The system was more like, hey Jim, does this fuel look good to you? Yeah man, looks fine to me. My engine doesn't explode while using it, so it's good. Aviation fuels of the period are estimated to be anywhere between 10 to 70 octane. For this build, we will be using a custom 30 to 40 octane fuel that JAG on the flyout server built with the assumption of a mid-grade World War I fuel. This is just around the time period where thermal cracking for petroleum and kerosene refining was invented, and such methods were used to refine the higher quality petroleum fuels you started to see during the war. Generally, these fuels were tested in engines of various compression ratios to figure out the quality of these fuels, just as we have octane engines for testing modern fuel quality. Although this fuel was, a uh, A bit susceptible to pre-ignition. This means we would only have a compression ratio of a whopping 3.5 to 1 if we didn't want to detonate the fuel before our ignition cycle. This means our gigantic 13.2 liter engine produced about 211 horsepower, coupled with a two-blade fixed propeller on the nose. 
If you can't tell, the nose of this aircraft is loosely based on the Albatross D3 or D5 as it's one of my favorite World War I planes, and I wanted to take a little bit of inspiration from it with its exposed components, liquid cooling, and large single overhead cam I6 engine. Moving on from there, World War I planes were designed to be lightweight and maneuverable. The engine for the plane I am building makes up almost half of the dry weight of the vehicle, for example. To keep this plane as light as possible so it could get off the ground, super lightweight construction methods were needed. The airframes consisted of an internal ladder structure made of wood as well as a skin usually made of either fabric or also wood. Some more monocoque parts of the vehicle on the fuselage were also made of lightweight wood. But I would really like to talk about something else. The only metal on this vehicle, for example, was the engine and that large heat shield I put around the engine to prevent it from burning the otherwise flammable plane to the ground. All this combined means the final takeoff weight of the vehicle is just over 800 kilograms, including the pilot and fuel. Now that we're done with the fuselage, let's talk a little bit about the wings. The wings of this vehicle consisted of an internal structure of wood as well as a cloth covering over them to massively reduce weight. Due to the massively low weight of World War I aircraft, the wings of this vehicle and many others don't have a lot of structural stability. People often say that biplanes were built for more lift, and while that's partly true, a major advantage of biplanes is the box shape the wings form. With nothing but a few struts and some wire bracing, a biplane wing with wooden supports can be incredibly stable. Or rather, structurally stable, allowing for these vehicles to have plenty of wing area without sacrificing any weight for internal structural support of the wings. While these wings were structurally stronger, they had far more drag than a typical monoplane, leading to far lower top speeds than their single-winged successors. I also added extra control rods in the back of the vehicle to really make this design stand out. Speaking of saving weight, however, the landing gear was another critical component of this. On early aircraft such as this, the landing gear was exclusively fixed. Fixed landing gear, while more drag inducing, is significantly lighter than any retractable counterparts, which at the time was only really used in amphibious aircraft, and fuselage retracting gear hadn't even been invented yet. These primitive gear only consisted of an axle, two large wheels for landing in softer fields, and sometimes an aerodynamic fairing. There was never a suspension other than what the rubber tires gave, and there was rarely even any brakes, most planes stopping in short enough distances due to the resistance of the craft anyways. More often than not, they didn't even have a tail wheel either, instead opting for a single skid on the back to provide the drag and steering such an airplane. This combination, while seemingly primitive, led to the lightest weights possible, and with such a low power engine, these lighter weights were required to get off the ground. The next and second heaviest component we would be adding to the vehicle was the guns. Around now was the time gun synchronization gears were invented, where the striking of the primer was mechanically linked to the propeller, preventing bullets from tearing up the prop when firing. Before this, they often had like elevated guns or nose guns, but we would be including two nose-mounted air-cooled 10mm machine guns on this aircraft. Moving on from there, we get to the cockpit or control system of the aircraft, which is surprisingly interesting. You see, World War I cockpits existed before instrument navigation or any regulation on cockpits, so surprise surprise, they had zero actual gauges inside the vehicle most of the time. Flew through a cloud? You might be lost. Low visibility flying? You're good as dead. Can't find your way home? Well, looks like you're going to crash in a field somewhere. At the very least, they were nice enough to put a compass in the plane to help you find your way back. The internals of my airplane were simple. I put an RPM gauge, fuel gauge, barometer, and basic compass inside the vehicle. This along with a throttle and a magneto switch made up literally the entire interior of this vehicle. I custom built the gauges on an art program to give it a vintage look as the in-game gauges weren't so good for that. This was also around the time airborne parachutes were invented, so I included some extra space behind my white plastic chair for the parachute. The open cockpit of such an aircraft allowed pilots to have full visibility at all times, allowing them to not only see but also hear the enemies. Hey, you hear anything? What? Also, fun fact of the day, there were a few German reports that the castor oil fumes from the engines caused poorly timed bowel movements. Since castor oil is a natural laxative, it does make sense, however, there are not any documented reports of this happening other than one personal account, so I can't say for sure it happened. 
At this point, however, we were just about done with the craft. All I did from this point on was add some panel linings, basic weathering, exhaust soot, and finally the roundels and colors of the BOA Air Force to make the design pop. And with that, it was finally time to fly out. Let's talk a little bit about the aircraft's performance when we get in the air. This is the Hawk GP2, my World War I biplane. Let's start with talking about the stats. If I end up making this a series, I would normally have an aircraft to compare this to, the one from the previous generation. Unfortunately, I don't have that as this is the first vehicle in my series, so let's make it a benchmark. If you guys like this idea and this series, let me know by liking and commenting below. If I can get over 3,000 likes over the next few weeks, I'll certainly make a part 2. However, let's just get on with the statistics. At low altitudes, the Hawk GP2 is quite fast, reaching speeds of just over 100 knots or about 185 kilometers an hour. Its sustained turn rate is also quite high, reaching rates of approximately 19 to 20 degrees per second in level flight. In a climb, the craft reaches about 5 to 6 meters per second, or about 10,000 feet per minute, at sea level. However, you may notice that this low altitude power quickly shaves off with altitude. It has so little engine power up here that it's feasibly improbable that a pilot would ever reach this altitude. Its turn rate decreases to about 11 to 12 degrees per second at these higher altitudes, and its top speed drops below 100 knots. Finally, its maximum endurance comes out to be somewhere between 200 and 300 kilometers. And that puts our vehicle at tier 1 out of 10 in our long climb to modern aviation. If you guys want to fly this thing yourselves, feel free to download it in my Discord server, links in the description below. Simply extract the zip file into your craft folder for flyout, and you should be all set. Either way, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you want to see another one. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.